I want to talk to you today about the preparation of the new creation. And uh, one of the things is that we can, and God cares about our, our moment right now, but we can also get so locked into the pain of the day or the challenge of the day that we miss God's bigger agenda for our life. And so I want to share with you some things today that I really believe are prophetic, not just for where you are now, but for where God wants to take you and where God wants to take the church. So I hope you're excited about that. Therefore, from now on, we regard nobody according to the flesh. So the moment we get born again, we are exhorted to see ourselves differently. Do you know in the book of Romans 5 to chapter 7, I believe 44 times the Apostle Paul says, you are dead. So we are to see ourselves different the moment we're born again. He says, even though we know Christ or have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anybody is in Christ, they are a new creation. Say with me, I am a new creation. The old has passed and all things have become new. And the greatest challenge for the believer is to see yourself as God sees you. I'll say it again. The greatest challenge for the believer is to see yourself as God sees you. And the Word of God says that you are now, the moment Jesus comes into your life, there is something new about you. It's not an upgrade. It's not a reboot. It's a whole new life inside us. Think about this. There was more gained at the resurrection that was lost in the fall. Say it again. There was more gained at the resurrection for mankind than was lost at the fall. God's work in Christ is superior to Satan's work in Adam. And Romans 5 talks about the how much more. And you and I see the evidence of sin, maybe in our own lives, whether it's sickness, fear, unbelief, whatever it might be. We see the evidence of sin in the world. It's everywhere. And it's pervading, it's, it's, you know, we're coming up to an election and we, we see all the stuff that's rising up, the fears, the issues of the day. And many believers think this is a hopeless case. The world is getting darker. We're familiar with, uh, as you watch TV, Christian TV, they're talking about old spirits of Israel resurfacing today and all sorts of things happening. And I'm sure there's demonic spirits. They've never gone away. They are eternal. But let me tell you something, that even though there's darkness in the world today, God is at work. And the church is a great hope of the world today. So Romans 5 says, No matter how much sin has reigned through one offence of one man, sin reigned through the earth. It says, How much more? How much more? Not a little bit more, but he's saying the effect that Adam had when he sinned and sin pervaded through the world, he says that's nothing compared to what Jesus did at the cross. And you might say, well, I see no evidence of that today. And many people would agree with you. There seems to be more evidence of sin in the world than God's grace in the world. But the big issue there is, it's because we haven't recognised what God did through Jesus at the cross. Open our eyes. And that's why the Bible says to him or to her who has ears to hear and eyes to see, let them see and let them hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. There's nothing wrong with what God has done. It is full and complete. Our issue is, God, give us eyes to see what you see about me. Wow, that was very good. And here's the hope that in Ephesians 3, that Paul says 
that this reality is going to be demonstrated to the principalities and powers, the manifold wisdom of God, which is the work of the cross is superior to everything that the enemy did. And he said that before the Lord returns, this manifold wisdom, the, the weakness of, of the cross or the, the foolishness of the cross to many, that manifold wisdom of God is going to be displayed to every principality and power. Before Jesus returns, there will be a full demonstration of what it means to be a new creation. See, God's been trying to tell us for some time, the church, the church, that He's about to do a new thing. You know, we've talked about new wine and new wineskin. And, and, and the, the new wineskin is the revelation of the new creation. I have no doubt about that. And that's what the wine is poured into. The problem with the new wineskin is that you've got to get rid of the old one. And to get rid of the old wine skin is not an abracadabra, a quick prayer moment. It takes a death for life to come. Have you noticed in the Bible that at significant moments, so the first one is Isaac, I think roughly is 2,000 years into history, and then John the Baptist, another 2,000 years. Both men born from a barren womb. Both men, when there was deep darkness and death, God says, I'm about to bring life. We're again at that same moment in history where it feels like something has died in the church. Maybe not for you, but when I look around the world, I'm saying, God, there's something more. And it feels like there's been a lull. We've been through COVID and all sorts of things. And there's been a death. And many people get despondent when there's death. Have you noticed, even in the practical, when we come to the end of the year and you've had a hard year, some people give up. They say, well, it's, it's death, it's, it's all over. But I want you to know too, that death in God's economy always transitions us to a new life, to a new day, to a new hope. That's why I love January the 1st, because it's time for death to bring life. Death is an end to itself. Jesus rose from the grave. Of anyone that should have hope in the world, it's the believer because death always produces life. So the new wineskin comes from the old wineskin. So many of us have been going through a cycle of death and it's been difficult. But I'm here to tell you something good. Life follows death in the kingdom. And so what's God been doing? He's been preparing the church because I'm just going to be brutally frank and honest with you. The state of the church, this is a generalised statement, it was never ready to take the new wine. It would have blown up the wine skin and spilt the wine. And so God takes the church through a death process where we have to let go of things that have inhibited what God wanted to do. And so today, I'm going to share about how God prepares the new creation. Amen? And I trust this excites you. Turn with me to Matthew 13, 24. Matthew 13, 24. I read this passage this week and it just came alive. So I thought, there you go. Let's go for it. Matthew 13, 24 is the parable of the tares and the wheat. It's how God prepares the church for what He's about to do. Now you'll notice in this passage, Jesus tells a story, a parable to the crowd, but He does not give them true spiritual depth in the parable. Later on in the, verse 36, the disciples come back and say, Jesus, tell us what you meant by that. And he unpacks the spiritual dimension of what he's just said. That's very interesting because if you study the parables, I encourage you always read Jesus' interpretation of the parable and then pray, God, give me ears to hear and eyes to see. Because you can sit here today and listen to me at, at an intellectual level and miss the whole point. 
And that's what the Pharisees did. That's what most of the crowd did. But Jesus has more than one level to communicate. He's got to communicate at an intellectual level, but he also wants to communicate at a spiritual level. So when you read his parable in the second part, he's unpacking all that's going on inside that parable. Does that make sense? Verse 24, now the parable Jesus put forth to them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the the grain sprouted and produced a crop, the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in that field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, don't do that. Because while you gather up the tares, you may uproot the wheat at the same time. It's very interesting that. This whole parable He's talking about tears both in the individual, but also even in corporate church or in families. It's very interesting. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first go and gather the tares, first go and gather the tares and bind them. And say to the reaper, sorry, and buy them in bundles to burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. There is an order in God's economy for the new creation believer. Verse 36, Jesus then unpacks his parable. He sent the multitude away and he went into the house. Some things God only wants to share with his friends. And you get to choose whether you're in the house. Or you're part of the multitude. What, 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 what's, what's the deal? Depends on your hunger. How many people here today really want to hear God speak? They're so desperate. I'm not leaving until I get a word from the Lord. Well, God will call you into the house. If you're casual, if you're looking at your watch and you're thinking about the roast dinner's on, I've I got to get out of here. I'm here just to fulfil a duty. Well, you'll just get the first part of the parable. And it wasn't Jesus. It was you. Because he'll speak to it, he'll call everyone into the house that wants to hear. That's put some pressure on you now, hasn't it? You dare not fall asleep. And the disciples said to him, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Jesus wants to communicate with you. He wants to explain what's going on in your life. Did you hear that? He, he doesn't want you kept in the dark. And Jesus answered it and said to them, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So that's Jesus, right? The field is the world and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. So that's that's the new creation believer. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. See how Jesus is now delving deeper into the realm of the spirit than he did in the first parable. Does anyone see that? The enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Therefore, as the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out angels and they will, these are gathering, reaping angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. Yikes. And those who practice lawlessness and will cast them in the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears to hear, and that is... I'll do it again. Whoever has ears to hear, and that is us, me, yeah. Let him hear. Okay, so let's quickly unpack this. Verse 37, he says, whoever, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. And the field, go back and look at this, is the world and the good seeds are the son 
of the kingdom. So Jesus has, is saying, I have sown good seed into the world. And this seed is, a har- is going to produce a harvest of people just like him. I pray that that's you today. The seed that he has sown is, is a seed that will reproduce identical people to Jesus. That's his deep desire today. It's the new creation. And he's saying that this new creation believer will be a reality before he returns. Some people might be thinking, well, I don't know if there's ever going to be a victorious church. Jesus has said this, mark my words, I have sown and he sowed that seed at the cross. He sowed a seed and he said, when I return, there will be a company of people. I don't know how big, how large, but there will be people all around the world that are identical to me in purpose. That should excite you. That's his desire for your life. He sowed a seed into your life and his deep desire is that you will be like him. It's amazing, isn't it? And he's promised to harvest these people using one of his special techniques called the host of angels. Angels that gather. They're at work in your life right now to prepare you to be the fullness of the new creation. And he goes on to say in this passage that the end of the age will be the ultimate harvest that the world has ever seen. We talk, I think, uh, Keith, you spoke about William Branham. And we've read about the amazing miracles, revivals. I know people that were at the end of some of those revivals. They're not hearsay. They were true. They were reality. People's lives were instantly changed. Those with addictions, the moment they were born again, were instantly set free. Those with alcoholism and and addictions, the moment they were born again, never touched it again for the rest of their life. Eternally changed, healed, set free. But the Bible says here that there is a harvest coming that is going to be like no other harvest ever seen. Let me tell you something about miracle signs and wonders. They are there to confirm the word. They are there because Jesus has a deep desire to build a new creation people. Wow. So Jesus says in this passage that he will only harvest that which is mature. He's not coming back for a weak church. He's not coming back for a church that's splintered, disunited, weak, sick, sick, feeble. He's coming back for a harvest that is mature. That gives me great hope. Does it give you great hope? Come on. Souls, destinies will be reaped because it says that these seeds are growing at a rapid rate both dark seeds and good seeds. There is a rapid rate of growth. So as you see the world get darker, take hope because God has promised that when deep darkness overtakes the world, it's nothing compared to what God is going to do in His church. So get your eyes on God's program today. He says in verse 38, And the tares are the sons of the wicked one, And the enemy that sowed them is the devil. In fact, in that first parable, he says the enemy has done this. You and I need to recognise that the enemy is going after you right now. The enemy is after you. The enemy has done this. The enemy is at work in your life today. There was no amen there, was there? And so you need to learn something about the enemy because he often is one of your greatest assets. If you learn what he fears in you and your family, you will, you will begin to understand what God is at work in your life. He only attacks people that are a threat to, them, to him. If you're not being attacked by the enemy, let me tell you something, he finds you no threat. You're a pushover, a wimp. 
But the moment the enemy comes after you and you feel like you're being attacked from every quarter, let me know you something that the enemy has got wind that God has a plan for your life. I've told many of you before, but I walked through the streets of uh, the city in, in Melbourne and I remember as we walked down Karen and I, a busker who was demonised, had a massive crowd around him. As I walked past, he stopped playing in the middle of his song. He pointed his finger at me. And he says, I know who you are, holy man of Jerusalem. I said, I know who I am as well. He knows you. He knows you. I've had other encounters in the city where demons have manifested. You may not believe this, it doesn't matter. I've had demons manifest in the flesh and come right up to me and begin to growl. They know who you are. They know who, who, who are the children of God, who are the new creation people. The enemy knows that. And that's not for us to be afraid. It's for us to understand that he, when he recognises God in you, then he begins to react. And God uses the enemy to show you where God has placed his greatest strength inside you. Is your body being attacked today by the enemy? I would suggest to you that there's a great healing anointing upon your life. Is your mind being attacked by the enemy today? Well, I suggest to you that God is reminding you that you have the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God. You need to understand the enemy is a fool because he always overplays his hand if God's people have ears to hear and eyes to see. Is he coming after your marriage or your family? Whatever it might be, step back and say, God, what is the enemy showing me that I need to see? Israel was always attacked by the enemy just at the point of victory. Go back and read it. Always just about to step into the victory and all hell breaks loose. And when you think, oh, it's a death, God's saying, no, there's life just around the corner. We misread. And so often the Holy Spirit will allow spiritual bullies to come into our life in the form of demonic spirits and, and oppression because he's trying to train us unto maturity. And so when we said new wine, new wine skin, and we all went, oh, yeah, this is going to be amazing. We were just signing up for boot camp to be pushed and pulled and poked and prodded because God's preparing the new creation believer for all that he wants to do. Joseph's betrayal, his dungeon experience, all that he went through was necessary to relocate him to a place of destiny and the purposes that God had for his life. Verse 39 says, The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Yikes. So Satan has sown into this harvest field unholy seeds called tares. And they are to yield the fruit of his kingdom. Can I suggest to you that Satan has sown into your heart unholy seeds called tares? Can I suggest that Satan has sown into the heart of this church unholy seeds called tares? Can I suggest again that he's sown into the world, in, into the greater church, unholy seeds called tares? You felt a little bit more comfortable when I shared point two and three, but not that first one. You see, a tear, or the Bible calls them darnels, I think, is a weed that looks like wheat, but it has... In the seed, there is no life that produces wheat. And it's only at harvest time that you really distinguish between what is wheat and what, what is a tear. And Jesus warned us, didn't he, that at the end of the age, there will be, there will be demonic spirits that so counterfeit God's work that it would deceive, if it were possible, the very elect. So in other words, there's things going on in our heart 
And we can't see whether it's a work of God or a tear. How many people can you talk to and they can look at you and they look like believers, they smell like believers and they say the most ugly, cruel things to you? I said to one person, and this is, this is generalised, but sometimes there are kinder people at the football club than the church. But of course not here. And so he warns us that Satan comes and sows tears. At the end of the age particularly, he'll sow tears into the heart of the church, into the hearts of believers. And one of the things about the tear is as it grows, it becomes more and more inflexible. That's how you distinguish the tear from the wheat. You know this, many of you know this, when harvest time comes, it's the fruit of the wheat that causes it to bow. But the tear remains upright and rigid because it has no fruit. So Satan wants us to be inflexible rather than take the place of humility. The wheat bows over because it has the fruit of a surrendered life. Not my will, but your will. I'm not going to be offended by what takes place, by what people say and do. It's the fruit of a surrendered life. And most, I'm going to generalise, but most what we would call backslidden Christians or people that no longer are part of a church community, it's because they've become relig uh, religious. Well, maybe that as well. But rigid, inflexible, and they don't bear the fruit of a surrendered life. They get offended. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. So God has a plan for your life. You ready? Everything that offends in your life, God is going to remove. Amen means so be it. So you've just invited the Lord to do that. And those that practice lawlessness, and he will cast them into the furnace of fire where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is two levels. This is both for the unbeliever who I believe will be cast, not because God desires, but because they choose. Hell was made for the devil and his demons, not for man. But we choose that through unbelief a lack of faith, refusing to believe in the work of the cross. So that on one level, this, this furnace of fire is, is the lake of fire, but the other level, it's where God takes your offences and burns them so there's no more trace. So here in verse 41 and 42, angels are working under the command of the Holy Spirit to prepare us for the fullness of the new creation. So it says here that angels that gather are now empowered by the Holy Spirit, listen to this, to remove, listen to the order, both internal and then external stumbling blocks in your life. We want God to remove the external stumbling blocks in our life, fix my husband, my wife, fix this problem, fix that problem. And God has an order who removes the internal stumbling blocks and then the external stumbling blocks. You excited about that? So we need to recognise that what is God doing right now in the church? He is sending forth His angels. They're called gathering angels or reaping angels. And they are at work to create scenarios in your life allowing the enemy access here or there to make sure that everything that offends in your life that stops the reality of the new creation is exposed and burnt to death. Wow. That's, That's what he's doing. It's great and I agree. I also say it's incredibly painful. An assignment has been given to them to assist us, assist us in extracting this. It says in verse 41. It 
seeds of corruption that have existed within you for many years. God, by his grace, is pouring water on them. Have you ever cast seeds on the ground? I love gardening and, you know, I've got this collection. It's like a cottage flowers and I threw them over this patch of, I had some extras over this patch of hard soil and, you know, hope for the best if it rains, it rains and some are starting to appear. Well, that's what's happening in the church right now in many believers. Things that have, lying, have laid dormant for years God is allowing his holy angels to set up circumstances so it's all coming to the fore. And you think the problem is external? The real issue is it's internal. So God allows external stumbling blocks to reveal internal stumbling blocks. And the pressure gets hotter and hotter and hotter and we begin to resist. And that's why many people do crazy things And they think the problem's outside of themselves. Listen to me, the problem's inside you. And that's why we go on holidays. Nothing wrong with a good holiday, is there? Anyone like a holiday? (laughs) Me too. And that's why we, you know, have facelifts and get new husbands and wives. Not here, of course, but just generally speaking. Buy a new car when we turn 50 and it's going to be red. Because we think if we can change all these things but there are internal stumbling blocks that the Lord is watering to try and get them to grow up so they can be harvested and burnt out of our lives. The problem is you can't recognise them. You can't recognise them until the tear grows with the wheat and, 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 and the difference is seen and the angels then can come and take it. God will not remove things out of your life too early. Because he says, I'll destroy both the wheat and the tare. You couldn't handle it. You can't handle the truth. As my good friend says. Do you know it's both individually and corporately? Have you noticed even in a church setting that God will allow stuff to sit there for so long and he won't allow people to touch it? because he loves the body and if you touch it too early, you would hurt too many people. So he allows it to grow and grow and grow and all of a sudden, bang, one day, someone no longer is in church. How did that happen? I've seen that all my life. That's the way God works. He allows it to grow and then he removes. God allows these behaviours that oppose the new creation to begin to blossom. Has anyone noticed recently that some bad attitudes have arisen in your life? Any anger, frustration, disappointment, discouragement? I went for a walk about a year ago. It's the first, no, no, I almost said something. It's the first time I can ever remember praying and I was angry. I, I don't think I can ever remember praying angry in my life. But me and the Lord, well, me and the Lord, the Lord just listened to me vent. But I was like, I don't know what the neighbours thought, but I was, I was pounding in the pavement saying, God, well, anyway, it doesn't matter what I said. But God's so gracious. He's been listening to people pray like that for years. That's why I love the Psalms. God, you know, David, one minute's like, God, what in the heck are you doing? You've made a big mistake and at the end of the psalm he's come around to God's way of thinking because he realises that God's got all the time in the world and you'll soon see it from my perspective. Lord, why do the rich prosper? And then at the end is, Lord, I've come to see from your perspective that life's just so fleeting. And so all these seeds of corruption are coming up and it's and it's really healthy that we... that. The Lord comes and he sends forth his angels to create an environment for it to be exposed and dealt with for what's about to happen. Because the end purpose is there's a harvest coming and if we have these things in our life that offend, the wine skin will be broken and the wine will be ruined. 
I hope you hear where I'm coming from today. Jude, he identified that in the end days that there'd be certain spiritual tears that would appear in the church. He said there would be the spirit of Cain, the spirit of Balaam and the spirit of Korah. And these would be all tears that would grow amongst us. He warned us. He said there would be a great harvest, but in amongst this, that God would allow these things to surface in our life. The spirit of Cain was a religious spirit, wasn't it? That's what Cain was. He was religious. You think about him, Cain was the first orphan. He had a father, but he acted like an orphan. Why? Because he was a murderer. Orphans are always threatened by people. They murder what God's doing. And they lack mercy and kindness. And one of the tears that God is removing is the spirit of orphans in the church. Orphans scratch, bite, kick, scream, and they murder. They, they are threatened by everyone else. He was threatened by his brother. And so these are tears. All of a sudden, God begins to put his finger on areas of our life. He said, that's an orphan-like behaviour. Get rid of it. I'm going to put some water on it. I'm going to let it come to the surface. I'm amazed by how many orphans there are in the church. And it's time for us to be healed. It's time for, for us to allow these seeds so we're not threatened by other people. We can celebrate other people. He talks about the spirit of Balaam, which is a, a spirit that merchandises the anointing. I don't want to go into that too much, but that particularly is aimed at leaders who, uh, who manipulate people through their supposed giftings and anointing for their own selfish agenda. So these are other things. We're seeing it right now in the body of Christ. God is exposing wrong hearts, wrong motivations right now. There, there are tears in the body of Christ that God's saying, I'm getting rid of. Almost every revival in the past that has short, been short-circuited is because of leaders that have had tears in their heart. Talks about the spirit of Korah, which is rebellion against God's anointed leadership. It's another tear in the body of Christ. I am perplexed. I'll say it again. I am perplexed by the lack of trust that people have in their spiritual leaders. You may sit there and say, well, I've got every right. Well, so have I. If anyone's got a right to be aware of spiritual leaders, it's me. But I'm perplexed in the body of Christ that the last person to be believed in is the leader. I find that amazing. I find it how, how stupid, and I'm going to be truthful, how stupid some Christians are that they can look at leaders, they can look at leaders have, who have led for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and have wonderful families and all the fruitfulness of that. And yet the moment something goes wrong, the Bible says don't take an accusation against an elder unless there are a number of people to, to confirm that. But they would choose to believe a lie about a leader than to trust them. I'm perplexed by that. That's a tear in the body of Christ. Well, why is that a big deal? Because the harvest cannot come in without true fathers and mothers in the faith leading God's people. But these are tears in the body of Christ. And, and if the enemy sows these seeds, it's so they come to the surface. And I ask people, when they distrust me or other leaders, what is in your heart that causes you to distrust? And maybe the Lord is pouring water on you right now in this moment. And maybe it's not about me or about them, but it's about you. So allow the angels to come in, allow the Holy Spirit to come in and pull out that tear that's rigid. See, how do you know you've got a tear in life? It's rigid, it's inflexible, and it won't surrender. It won't surrender its agenda. It won't surrender its opinions. It's called passive aggressive. They look like they're godly people, but inside they're inflexible to change and they refuse to believe. 
And God wants to come and uproot it and burn it out so you'll be one of those sons in the kingdom and daughters in the kingdom that shine like light in these last days. Amen. And this is not about me. This is not about me trying to say, you know, you need a hero worship. I mean, if you think that, then you, you know, you've been, I was going to say, smoking your Kool-Aid. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's about us coming into a place where we're ready for the harvest. So he says in verse 43, then the righteous will shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. What an amazing passage of scripture, hey? We're going to shine. So once the extraction is completed and the Lord's done his work, there is going, he's promised us a harvest like we've never, ever could comprehend. It's amazing. So the angels work within us to prepare us then they work with us to gather. What is God doing right now? This is what I believe He's doing. He's working in us to prepare us so He can work with us to gather. Joseph, if there's anyone in the Old Testament that is a picture of Jesus and the new creation believer, it's Joseph. There is so many Pictures of Joseph that you see in the life of Jesus, you can put them side by side. That happened to Joseph, that happened to Jesus. It's identical. And God prepared this man and he went through an incredible season of pain, of of extraction because God was preparing him to save the world at the darkest time of history. And he gave him an amazing strategy that I just want to finish with you today. Think about this. The strategy was to gather all the labourers. How many, what, is anyone here a labourer in the kingdom? That's not a trick question. We're all labourers in the kingdom. Pray the Lord the harvest to send out labourers. So the strategy wasn't the harvest, the end, which was the world there, the first strategy was get the labourers working to fill the barns with wheat for the coming famine. Do you understand that? So for seven years they went out. And here's the thing. Don't misread what I'm, don't mishear what I'm going to say. The world wasn't yet hungry enough to receive what Joseph was storing up. Now, I am not saying, because the Bible says preach the word in season, out, out of season. I'm not saying that people around you aren't hungry for God. I am not saying that. What I am saying is that we have not stepped into the time of history where the world is so desperate they are going to come from everywhere to eat what you have. But we're on, on our way. And we're in a season where what is God doing in the church? He's preparing the harvesters. Because if the world came hungry today with all the offence in our hearts and all the issues and the orphan-like behaviour, we would destroy it. New wine is for new wineskin. So God loves the church, the wineskin. He doesn't want us broken in the process, but he also values the new wine, which the harvest is. So God is on a on a journey now, a quick work to get us ready for what he's about to do. What is God doing in the church? He's removing all the obstacles so we are ready for when the world becomes desperate. I hope you don't mishear what I said then because I'm not saying we shouldn't be evangelising, witnessing. I'm saying understand God's eternal plan. And what he did in Joseph was a model for what he's about to do in the end time church. Hopefully that didn't go over head. I don't think it did. So what Joseph gathered up in preparation was reserved for a season of incredible hardship. And we all know that the Bible says that the world is going to get darker and darker 
and more desperate. And at a pivotal moment, it's going to be like Joseph opened the doors up and Egypt became the most powerful nation in all of the earth. Think about that. What's God saying to the church? I'm storing something in the lives of my people, such a treasure. I'm about to open it up and they will come from the north, the south, the east and the west and I will set my church up. Remember Ephesians says that the church will be a display of the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers. What was Joseph? He was a manifold demonstration of the wisdom of God as the answer of the world. It's incredible, isn't it? God gave Joseph three different anointings in that season. And you may want to write them down because this is what God is wanting to give you as he removes things that offend. This is what he wants, wants to put in your life. Joseph had all those three things. He had all those things removed, offence, bitterness, orphan heart, all those things. You know, all, they were all removed during that time with Potiphar and in jail. And then God gives him these three things when he harvests. Genesis 41, 41, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have put you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring, his signet ring, and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in a garment or garments of fine linen. And thirdly, it says he put a gold fasashi necklace around his neck. And then he looked like he was a gangster. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? In one day, one day. Did you hear me? In one day. Yeah, you know, it looks a long way away. God can do a lot in a day. When God prepares you, it doesn't take long to release you into your destiny and for the church. So you might look at and think, well, how could it ever happen? It doesn't take long. Once God prepares his church in one day, he can open the door and everything begins to shift. He put a ring on his finger and that ring was a picture of spiritual authority. The new creation has spiritual authority and the full endorsement of the king. God is going to give the church incredible authority and dominion. It's, 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 you know, it's not just going back to the garden, it's that and more. It's spiritual authority at a tremendous level. Listen to me, authority over demons. Those that are tormented in their mind, authority over sickness and disease. He put his ring on his finger and he said, you are now second in charge. Everyone will bow at your feet. He gave him authority. The second thing he gave him, it says, is linen garments, which is, you know, the garments are a picture of being clothed in purity and, and the nature of Christ. This is, this is garments of Jesus' character and nature. It's being clothed in humility. That's why you get all the offences taken out. He's going to give us authority and he's going to clothe the church in incredible humility, unoffendable. Those that want to honour Jesus, they'll be given great authority, but they will still know that they bow to the name of Jesus. Incredible humility and Christ-likeness. We will learn to be kind to each other again. They will know that these people are my disciples because they have love for one another. They don't tear each other's eyes out. They don't mistrust each other. There will be incredible clothing of the nature of Christ amongst God's people. And all God's people said about that one, amen, amen. And then he gave him a gold chain, which is a picture of the prosperity entrusted to this sort of people. And that's what God has promised for those that will be unoffendable in these times. You will need prosperity, you'll need authority, and you will walk in humility. 
Job 8.7, as we close, says, Though your beginning was insignificant, yet your end will increase greatly. Though you've been hiding in, in some back room and it feels like you've been getting the stuffing kicked out of you, it feels like all the, you've been ganged up and there's been all this offence and, and you've been going through all this stress. Though your beginning was insignificant, it feels like you've been on the, on the forgotten mantelpiece and, and, and things have been so tough, but you remain faithful. Though your end, it says, will increase greatly. And that's the picture of the church. God has been preparing. He hasn't forgotten the church, but he has sent forth his holy angels to begin to remove everything that offends. If there's stuff in your life that's offensive now, rejoice that, that God has watered it and you begin to see it. The worst thing is that there's offence in your life and you've got no clue. And I've always prayed this prayer, God, don't let me get, well, let me get to heaven, but don't let me get to heaven and there's been all this junk in my life and I had no idea. And the fire comes and it burns all this stuff up. Let the fire burn now, not when I get to heaven. Let me come forth as gold, Lord. Everything that offends, bring it to the surface. And I would say in the last two years, there's been a lot of burning going on in my life. But that's a good thing. It's a sad thing that it's there, but it's a good thing that it's exposed and dealt with. And God's doing that because there's a harvest that is coming to his church. And verse 43 of Matthew 13 finishes by saying, let them that have ears to hear, let them hear. I don't know the reason why, but Isaiah was sent to a people that would refuse to listen. They didn't have ears to hear. And we're talking about it at home and the people were so ticked off with him, they got a wooden saw out and they cut him in half. I don't know what the half represents. It might represent the old and the new. And they were presented with the option of change, but they wanted the old. They didn't want the new. They wanted to hold on to their offence. They didn't want to listen. Their hearts were hardened. And God sent a man called Isaiah to declare the kindness. If you read the book of Isaiah, there are, it's full of woes, but, but there, there's so much compassion in Isaiah. God's calling these people back with everlasting kindness. I'll, I'll, I will no longer remember your sins against you. And He calls them and He pleads with them. And God's saying that to the church again. Let me deal with the offences in your life because there's a harvest coming that I need labourers for. I'm looking for labourers. I'm not looking for brain surgeons. I'm not looking for people with necessarily high IQ. I'm looking for people that will be like that wheat that will grow, allow the, the Word to bear fruit in their life and they will surrender their life and say, Lord, whatever you want to do, count me in. Lord, whatever you want to burn in my heart, burn it out so I could be used in this end time harvest. For there's coming a day that God will open the door for a world that's so hungry. And I wanna be part of the Joseph company, the new creation believer that says, Lord, I'm ready to dispense what you have. Healing, deliverance, kindness, love, transformation, whatever it is that you wanna flow through me, do it, Lord. So Lord, today we pray that you would prepare us for this harvest of souls that you have. We surrender afresh our life and where there's a fence, where there's, where there's stumbling blocks in our life, we invite you to pour the water upon these seeds and let them come alive so we can see them and you can remove them. Send forth your angels your Holy Spirit to remove all that doesn't belong in the new creation believer and cause us to be like you said, those that shine like the sun in the kingdom. Cause us to be those that are bright in a place of darkness. I ask in Jesus' name, prepare us and send us, I pray, Lord. 
in Jesus' name. Why don't you ask the Lord to do that in your life? You may be aware of stumbling blocks, offence, whatever it might be in your life. Even now, the Lord's been putting His finger on areas. Why don't you be like the wheat and bow and surrender and say, Lord, not my will, but Your will. Whatever it might be, you might have been offended, hurt, disappointed. Surrender that to Him. Surrender afresh today. Lord, we give You our hearts afresh. And like Joseph, prepare us to be used for Your glory, we ask in Jesus' name.